Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, hello to everyone online too. Uh, today is our next installment of Maple Syrup History. Of course, as you can see on the board, we are talking about the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Certainly one of the most famous, if not the most famous tragedies, disasters in American history, but also world history. For anyone needing a quick uh, review as well, the course is called Catholicism and Disasters. We talk about the disaster and then a kind of Catholic uh, response to it. You see on the board, I have uh, Sinking of the Titanic, CCC. That stands for um, the kind of chronological narrative, first C, then some conspiracies about the Titanic and then the Catholic um, response to it. I have 13 framing points, but it's about 70 in reality. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground today. I almost think that I kind of wish like we'll do for Chernobyl and like we'll do for 9-11, that I dedicated an entire week to the Titanic. I have not, we're just gonna cover it today. But we're, we'll certainly go full time. I wanna do a shout out to, to my two sons as well, Soren and Bjorn. They are both huge fans of the Titanic and the Hindenburg disaster. We're covering the Hindenburg disaster in about two weeks. So a lot of, of all the episodes of Maple Syrup history, these will certainly be dedicated um, to them, to that point of interest, I would say. All right, so without further ado, um, parts of a ship. It's point number one that I want to talk about. Anyone know uh, what the front of a ship is called? Um, okay, good. I did not know that's about five minutes ago. <laughs> so what is the back of the ship called? Starboard. Very good. What is the right side of the ship? Starboard. Starboard. What about the left side of the ship? Okay. Why is the starboard side? I have no idea. What? They used to have on the real old ones, they had a steer board on that side. Okay. Ah. Work at the other side because you wouldn't want to. Move up to something against the steer board, you break it off. Got it. This is the port side, as if the side, well, you have to know where you fill up your gas tank, right? When you pull up to the. There you go. Yeah, we want to avoid, we want to avoid these kind of, well, um, <laughs> foundational mistakes. Very, very good. Okay, keep in mind, especially the bow and the stern, the bow, when we talk about the sinking. What we're going to do today, kind of obvious enough, but yeah, we're just going to go over, you know, what happened. As I said earlier, conspiracies related to it, and then Catholic reaction. So uh, really quickly as well, kind of a second, that's the first point zero, or let's say point minus one. This is point zero, information on the captain. Who is the captain of the Titanic? He went down the ship. He did. Very, very brave man who kind of classically, um, I can't think of a different word, other than uh, than classic, you know, the classical, like I will go down with my ship, I will not abandon my ship, Edward Smith. Here's some information about Edward Smith in case you're interested. Remember again, the Titanic sinks April 15, 1912. So 111 years ago. Smith at the time of the voyage, the maiden voyage of the Titanic is very much a seasoned naval man. And he is uh, 62 years old. He's born in 1850 in Stratfordshire, England. He's the son of a potter and a grocer. He stops going to school around the age of 12 and really gets involved in marine life. In 1867, as a 17-year-old boy, signs on to the crew of the Senator Weber. He rises up um, through the ranks. In 1885, at the age of 35, he is made first officer of the Republic. Two years later, 1887, he, he marries this woman, named Eleanor Pennington, and him and his wife, Eleanor, have one child, a daughter, Helen, born in 1902. Smith uh, fights in the British Royal Navy during the Boer War. Next week, we're going to be talking about what I believe is to be the most foundational event of the past 500 years, the First World War. And we'll talk about the Spanish uh, flu in the wake of that. We will have, as I lamented, not having about the Titanic, uh, two classes on the First World War sp slash Spanish flu. The Boer War of the late 1890s is an immediate kind of preamble to the First World War. A lot of veterans who fight for England and other countries in the, who are involved in the Dutch army, et cetera, in the First Boer War, look at it kind of like a training ground for, you know, 16 years later to come. Smith is involved in this as well. 
And by the time that he gets involved in the White Star Line, more to come on that in a second, but that company of which the Titanic was a part, he is very much a seasoned, respected. Think about today, the best example will be what? Smith is like a seasoned what by the time that he's you know really involved with the White Star Line. When did he go down? 1912. Commander. 19 <laughs> captain. Yeah, sure, certainly, he's a captain, but, and I'm kind of posing this question maybe awkwardly, but imagine you meet a guy at uh, the coffee shop down at Monica's. What would Captain Edward Smith be today in today's iteration of travel? He'd be like what? He'd be like a guy who's logged 30,000 miles for American Airlines, pilot, exactly. This kind of, think, seasoned pilot who you you board the plane, you're happy to see this guy. You know, he's 60 years old, maybe he was a veteran of the Air Force, right? That's exactly what I'm looking for. You know, a different form of travel, but uh, he, this guy is not some novice or some you know, young kid, as is the case in a later disaster. If you're here for the Chernobyl week, We'll talk about a large problem with that was the fact that kids were basically manning the controls. I still consider myself a kid at 36 years old compared to my academic colleagues who are in their 50s and 60s and kind of really seasoned at the top of their game. I'm talking about kids at Chernobyl, like engineers fresh out of school, like 22, 23, like actual kids. Smith is not that. He's 62 years old. You think like the height of his powers as a sea captain, very seasoned, would be like exactly a very experienced airline pilot. Wait, this is really stupid. When was the World War I? 1914. This is two years before the First World War, the sinking of the Titanic. Did you say he was in Rome for a minute? No. No, the Boer War. <laughs> With the Boer War, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy it's crazy to think too sorry smith all these people that die by the way are kind of like pro forma but truly god rest all their souls no all these people that that have died you know this that died in this you know which is still to this day the deadliest um peacetime naval disaster in history mm -hmm. it's crazy to think they never see the first world war this thing that we just take so for granted oh yeah world war one world war two the atomic bombs you know whatever right these guys died before any of that came to pass I'm going to have at the end, anyone who came in uh, late too, I have, and you're not late, you're on time. I just, I mentioned this earlier, CCC is the chronological narrative. Then the last C is the Catholic reaction, but the middle C is conspiracy theories related to the Titanic. That's, that's our kind of lecture frame. And I have 13 main points, but approximately 70. What's the real number below that? A last foundational point before we get into the narrative, just straight ahead. Smith was one of those foundational. Second one is, I encourage all of you to look up quote, Father Brown's Titanic album. Brown spelled with an E. Brown like Brown plus E. This is a Jesuit priest, Father Frank Brown, who was born in 1880. At the time of the Titanic voyage, he's 32 years old, dies in 1960. Well, wait, did he survive? What happened? He never was on the last leg of the journey. As I will soon uh, disclose, the Titanic takes two small trips first to France and then to Ireland before embarking across the sea. The maiden voyage is this kind of, let's use the airline analogy again. The main flight is, let's say, Dulles to Seattle. But before that, you know, we do Moscow, Moscow to, um, you know, Portland and whatever kind of stopover flights. Father Frank Brown, this Irish Jesuit priest, is... Um, is on the Titanic at the for the first two parts, out of England to France and then to Ireland. And he gets a telegram, quote, get off that ship. It's an order from one of his superiors. He's a priest. He has to obey. And a later joke, joke is the wrong word, but um, when news of the Titanic's disastrous fate reached Father Brown, he folded the telegram, get off that ship, and put it into his wallet and kept it there for the rest of his life. Understandable. He said later it was, quote, the only time holy obedience had saved a life. Mm -hmm. um, so he was supposed to be on this journey. He gets off. This is not part of the conspiratorial section. It's actually part of the last section. Catholic reactions. I'm going to have four very beautiful and moving kind of Catholic reactions. The statement of the bishops' conference at that time. But this is another kind of free one. Father Brown, an also accomplished photographer, despite not being on the main part of the journey, and thank God, photographs a large number of the kind of interior exterior import you know part of the titanic's journey okay so we're done did the telegram say why no something to do with jesuit stuff 
And so it was totally unrelated. It had nothing. It literally it's a, it's a, yeah. That's yeah. Thank you, and that's that's a great point. That's exactly what I'm not saying, right? It's it's not like oh, this is conspiratorial. His superior had a dream of the ship, you know, sinking or something. No, it was hey, I need you to cover masks for this guy or something. And just so like we, we're going to talk, we are duh, right? I've mentioned this so many times. We're going to talk about 9/11 later in the semester, a whole week. There's a lot of stories like that. On the morning of 9-11, I was supposed to be on flight 93 and this happened, right? You know, I was supposed to go, I'm not talking about me. I was not personally. I'm saying, you know, people. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they, something got, uh, a business meeting that was supposed to be in San Jose got moved to uh, San Diego and so I had a different flight, but I was supposed to be on that flight. Just mm -hmm. something like that. It just, yeah. it's a coincidence. Now, C.S. Lewis famously said, you know, either nothing is a coincidence or everything is. And we believe in God's providence. This guy lives to 1960. Who knows? Maybe you know, God willing, all of us go to heaven. We find out Father Brown, that guy, saved 321 souls in the course of his ministry. And he that and God didn't want him to die on the Titanic because he needed to like minister to these people in Ireland in the 30s. Who knows? That is so above my understanding. I can't, I can't even like begin to fathom that. God alone knows. So of course it could be providential. What I'm saying is no, there's no reason like there wasn't anything creepy about this. There's creepy stuff to come pretty soon. There's some pretty creepy conspiratorial stuff. Uh, I'm excited to share that with you pretty soon. This is not one of them. This is simply go check out this Titanic album. All right, guys, I have so much to get through. We might here be here for six hours. And if we are, it's fine. Yeah, I'm going to make it longer. I haven't had coffee yet today. So you know what? I will say, I'll, I'll drink your coffee for you. I have three coffees in this one. Did you say Father Brown subsequently saved 300 lives? No, no I was speculating. I was kind of like, I, I, I was kind of like free riffing in re regards to your point. You said, why did he, why was he ordered off that ship? Was it because there was some premonition? I said, no, it was very innocuous. Okay. He was told by a spirit, but, but I'm saying that God alone might know Father Brown lives in 1960. Instead of dying that year, Father Brown lives 48 more years. I'm saying it's known to God alone. Maybe it was providential, but that's known to God. It's not like there was some Jesuit superior later says, oh, I just thought he would die. No, but it, it was very run of the mill. Who knows when run of the mill stuff actually is God's hand. You were you were called to go to this time, and then you missed being part of an earthquake or something. And it was God's hand, but but you don't know that. That's what I'm saying. I, I have no idea, and I really do not like people who like try to find like prophecy under every rock kind of stuff. I if the church says something is like supernatural and all, I accept that. But I'm no. From everything I know from this, the facts are simply he just was told to get off the ship. Nothing to do with it sinking. Just we need you to cover a mass or go do something. All right, the RMS Titanic. And in any case, in any case, people don't know, was a British passenger liner operated by the White Star Line that sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on April 15th, 1912. It actually hits the iceberg on the 14th. Are we going to talk about that in detail? You know we are, absolutely, in deep detail. But just to tell you right now, it hits the iceberg about 11.40 p.m. on the 14th. It sinks at, after 2 o'clock in the morning, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah, it's horrifying. Think about, yeah, being tucked into bed the previous night with like hot cocoa or something at 9 p.m. And two hours later, you know, by midnight, this iceberg hits just horrifying. The middle of the night making it all the more like that, uh, you know, getting a phone call in the middle of the night, you know, 1206 kind of stuff, right? Uh, of the estimated 2,224 passengers and crew, about 1,500 died. It is the deadliest sinking of a ship up to that time and the deadliest peacetime sinking, sinking of any ocean liner or cruise ship to this day 111 years later is still the, arguably the most famous I, I think there's no question this is not just set out, out of american pride whatever we do in america is most important in the world america is a very important country on the world stage arguably the most with tons of emulators and people who love america and tons of haters but it's very visible i would say there's no question the titanic is the most famous maritime disaster ever especially when you think about we're not going to talk about this at all but the 1997, you know, Kate Winslet, Leo DiCaprio movie, James Cameron movie, that just makes it all the more so, you know, for a new generation. So it's it's the most famous one. What's crazy is there's 2,000, there's 2.2 thousand people on board. Anyone know how many people could could have been on board? What was the carrying capacity total? 3.3 thousand. So it's still only about 65% full or something. It still was not as full as it could have been. In fact, I'll give you more. The whole passengers and crew is 2.2 thousand. It could have held up to 3.3 thousand, 3,300 people. Mm -hmm. 
Does that matter at all? No, not really. I mean, every life is precious. It's not like, oh, well, thankfully only 1,500 died when instead it could have been, you know, over 2,000. Every life is precious to those families. And I don't think it would make it, you know, much more disastrous. Just the fact that, like, FYI, it was not full. Very interestingly, is there any connection between the Titanic and 9-11? Not really. But, but, but very interestingly, on 9-11, a lot of those planes were very understaffed. I don't know if you know that. A lot of the planes of 9-11 were like 50% empty. They were not, yeah. Wow. Just, just well, we'll, you know, we'll talk a lot about that when we get closer to, when we get to that lecture. The name Titanic obviously derives from the titans of Greek mythology. This is a throwaway fact, but one of the 70 ones I'm going to give you today, I'm going to give you, I told you, I went on flock note and we get my flock notes and talk about how it's going to be the greatest class ever it is. This is going to be the most detailed class of all time. I would give this to Kate Middleton and King William when he ascends the throne. I'd be like, this is in honor of combined American British history. I'm given every fact, every possible fact, including that. It was built in Belfast. In the Titanic, she was the second of three Olympic class ocean liners. The lead vessel was the Olympic. Anyone know the third name? Third vessel? Mm -hmm. The Olympic, Titanic, and the what? The Britannic. Uh, these three were by far, maybe, you know, perhaps obviously the largest of all the ships in the White Star Line's the fleet. The Titanic and the Olympic both sunk. What happened to the Britannic? Did you not know? I'm not sure. No, I don't know. Does anyone know? That's my kind of money back guarantee forever. I will never tell you information when I don't know. You know. Uh, it was up into World War One, and it was hot. And was because it was hot, and all the bubbles were open. Mm. And say that it wouldn't be sunk. Yeah. The water came in so much faster. Yeah. Yeah. It might have been. Hmm. Was it? on the ti the Titanic yeah, itself. There's a little like a grift, you know, yeah. whatever. Wow. Well, here's uh yeah, here's your coffee. Well, it's mainly water, but you know, five bucks. Yeah, yeah, got it. The White Star Line was an American line? No, no. So actually, here's your information. The White Star Line was a British shipping line. It started as a kind of packet company, you know, shipping different cargo throughout the world. By the early 1900s, remember, please, dates matter so much. Duh, right? History is dates. The chronology frames stuff. By early 1900s, the maiden voyage that we're going to focus on today is 1912. By early 1900, people start getting interested in providing, uh, you know, luxury passage. And that is what, note that, that is what distinguishes, sets apart the White Star Line from its competitors. They're like, other people like speed. We move pretty fast too, but people, other people are promising you that we'll get you across the ocean, England to New York City, basically, as was the journey here supposed to be, Right. Or for you know, uh, out of uh, excuse me, out of Ireland on the on the third stopover, um, the second stopover, France, England to France to Ireland across the North Atlantic to New York City, we'll get you across to America fast. The White Star Line brands their services by focusing on comfortable passage, and for everyone. And please note this now: everyone probably has heard, oh, if you were in third class on the Titanic, that was bad. Third class on the Titanic was as good as first class. Some other ones. If you were a poor immigrant, poor Irish classic, like DiCaprio's character Jack in Titanic, the Titanic was the place to be, actually. We'll talk about why. Again, I'm giving you every possible fact. Every fact I can think of today. Um, okay, here are the facts. The tonnage of this ship, the Titanic, which is once more an Olympic-class ocean liner, is... Um, 46,329 tons. Its length, it is almost how long? How many feet long? Who knows? Give me a century mark. You know, a zero, zero number. How many feet long is, is the Titanic almost? It is almost 900 feet long. It is 882 feet and nine inches long. 
That is bonkers long. I love football. I love football, period. Full stop. A football field goalpost to goalpost is 360 feet. Two football fields, goalpost to goalpost is 720 feet. This is two football fields, and a basketball court is 94 feet. So 720 for two football fields, basketball court gives you about, it is, this is longer. This is longer from, you know, the bow to the stern, the whole thing, uh, than two consecutive football fields plus the basketball court. It is enormous. Um, its height from the keel to the top of the funnels is 175 feet. It has nine decks. I'm going to tell you what's on all these decks. And the last time that I'll shut up, I'm being a broken record saying this, but all the details. Again, for, you know, her and his majesty, Will and Kate. Info for them. Only the best quality for them. But are we referencing them today? I'm, I'm, they're online right now. They're listening to this from Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Why? <laughs> They right now in the UK they've stayed up. It's ten o'clock. They had like their drawing room tea and stuff. And then Will texted me. He's like, "When is your lecture beginning, bro?" Question mark. And I was like, "Soon." I'm like, "It's starting soon." So they're up. They're up and watching this. That's that's why I keep referencing. So again, hello to you all. Thank you for joining us. This is truly an honor. Um, there's nine decks. There's nine decks from A to G, right? And I'll list all of them. In terms of the power, listen to this. Now, I am not an engineer whatsoever, but even someone like me who has no knowledge of engineering feats and even something as simple as like a V8 engine and whatever and what that means and horsepower, it has 24 double-ended and five single-ended boilers feeding two reciprocating steam engines for the wing propellers and a low-pressure turbine for the center propeller. The output is how many, how much horsepower? Who thinks? The like total power. 46,000 horsepower. Okay, so equivalent to 46,000 galloping steeds on the open plains, but here on water. The propulsion is two three blade wing propellers and one central propeller. Its cruising speed is 24 miles an hour. Its max speed, 26. So this is really, this, is, uh, this boat is chilling. Think about this, right? Everyone's had this experience. You're driving in a car, which no one needs me to tell you is not 900 feet long, right? You're driving in a car on cruise control, let's say going 85 on like, you know, in, uh, open interstate. There's places in Wyoming, obviously don't do this. But there's obviously places in Wyoming on Interstate 80 where you can go 100 miles an hour, hit the cruise crawl, because like you're going 50 miles an hour, right? Uh, where the roads are like in Nebraska, where you can see there's no, no traffic, nothing, beautiful paved macadam, and you can see like 15 miles to the horizon. You And I've never done this. You probably could go, you know, professional driver, probably easily do 120, 130, feel like it's just cruising along. That's in a small car on a highway, and it still feels like you're going slow. You feel like you're not moving on the Titanic, right? And this is gonna be very, very important for the experience because you're going 26 miles an hour, which is basically as fast, I kid you not, as the top speed that Usain Bolt can run. So you're, you're the, the, so a man can run faster than top speed of this and it's 900 feet. So just the kind of trick that plays on you gives you, gives you this experience of, and here is the whole key, the way the White Star Line sold this, of being in a hotel or a beautiful fancy house by the beach. You're not really on a boat. And we'll get there eventually. And why rush? Look at all these cool things we have. I'm going to tell you what these cool things are in a second. Well, let's not go back. How much you burn? Ocean I have no idea. I, yeah, I compared it. I'm sure faster than 26 miles an hour. I'm sure with modern technology, you know, it times the top speed. And we think about like, someone look up how fast can like, how fast did like destroyers go in the Second World War? I actually, I have no idea. It'd be an interesting comparison. This is not fast. I mean, you have the illusion in a good way of kind of standing still. It's so like you have these beautiful balls and dinners and everyone has seen the movie, right? Okay, here's the scary thing. Go I ahead. put in nothing and I just wrote in how fast and said, do cruise ships go? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I might have to get out of anything. Five miles an hour. There you go. Well, thank you for that. And thanks, thanks to the phone. Thank you, AI. Um, there are, here's obviously this, here's, yeah, it's, well, AI, guess what? Uh, you suck compared to humans, so take that. Google how stupid is AI? Um, and then, <laughs> how dumb is AI compared to people? Mad. Um, um, passengers. The total capacity of the boat is about 3.5 thousand people total. Remember, it's very understaffed. Underfilled, excuse me. Sadly, this is the whole point. You probably know the last fact that I'm going to give you. There's only 20 lifeboats. 
sufficient for about 1,000 people, a little over 1,000 people. The whole thing obviously here was, as you all know, again, this is an unsinkable ship. If something does happen, it's not going to sink. It's going to stay afloat. Boats will come to its rescue. We'll kind of siphon people out. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's no problem. Even if you're in one of these lower decks, that was the kind of idea. Let's look at the boat structure. Okay. So remember, there are decks all the way from the boat deck, which is where the lifeboats are housed, the very top, obviously. And it's from the boat deck that the lifeboats are lowered into the ocean on this fateful early morning hours when all this chaos is happening. Here are the decks, and they are in descending order from the top down to the bottom, mm -hmm. okay? In alphabetical descending order. A deck, all the way down to the bottom, right? A deck was also called the promenade deck, promenade, you to walk around, right? Extended along the entire 546 foot length of the superstructure. It was reserved exclusively for first class, first class passengers and contained first class cabins, first class lounge, a smoke room, reading and writing rooms, and a palm court. B deck, also known as the bridge deck, was the top weight bearing deck in the uppermost level of the hole. Most more first class passenger accommodations were located here with six palatial state rooms, palatial, palace like, right? Cabins featuring their own private promenades. This is like Betsy Johnson level of decadence. <laughs> um, <laughs> hello, Betsy. <laughs> On Titanic, the a la carte restaurant and the Cafe Parisian provided luxury dining facilities to first class passengers. The Cafe Parisian is literally a kind of French modeled cafe on this boat. Remember, I'm gonna say it again. What does the White Star Line promise you, Barb? It doesn't promise you speed, it's fast. Betsy writes luxury, mm -hmm. triple exclamation, exactly. It promises you a, you're gonna be like, as if you're a member of the Vanderbilt, Carnegie, Rockefeller, et cetera, family. If, even if you're second class, even if you're third class, Talk about a lot of like even just straight up communist people. Oh, look at the working class oppressing the poor. I do not like communism, and I find a lot to fault with capitalism. Go distributism. Go third way Catholic economics, a la Rerum Novarum or uh, Quadragesimo Anno. Fine. If you want to make an argument for capitalism and triple down effects, and if the rich make a ton of money, the lower class benefits too. Titanic's a good example, actually. Yeah, on A and B deck, it's crazy luxury. The lowest decks Titanic for your third class passenger is like being first class on other, on other lines. This is a, if you want to make a good capitalist argument about a, you know conspicuous consumption and palatial cabins benefiting everyone else, we'll just listen and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. C deck, the shelter deck was the highest deck to run uninterrupted from stem to stern. D deck, also known as the saloon deck. And of course, again, they're going down like this, all the way to the bottom of the boat. D deck was dominated by three large public rooms, first class reception room, first class dining saloon, and second class dining saloon. Mm -hmm. An open space was provided for third class passengers on this time to like have parties, whatever. Like literally, like, they do a good job, right? They, of course, they burn the rich so much on the Titanic movie, right? You know, Rose, Kate Winslet, they're, they're everyone's so stolid and stodgy and first class and hope they're even bringing my caviar where she goes down exactly. below. She goes down, you know, with, with Leo and they party and dance. Well, yeah, there's an open space here too that you guys can come and whatever and sing Irish songs and all this stuff. Um, first, second, and third class passengers, class mixing on D deck, had cabins on this deck with berths for firemen located in the bow. E deck was predominantly used for passenger accommodation for all three classes, once more, plus berths for cooks, seamen, stewards, and trimmers. Finally, F deck, the middle deck, we're getting pretty low now in the boat, was the last complete deck and mainly accommodated second and third class passengers. However, in addition to the third class dining saloon, um, there was also a swimming pool, kennels, for when you want to bring Lassie, probably not Lassie, Rottweilers and Mastiffs, like the cool dog breeds, only allowed on the Titanic. More Mastiffs, more Rottweilers. Shout out to Monroe the Mastiff. Those who know, know what I'm talking about. And uh, Tur a Turkish bath. What is a Turkish bath? It is a sick spa experience, hot tub, baths of Agrippa, Roman style. Let's go. I'm not going to lie, as I was preparing for this lecture in a hot tub, by the way, I was preparing my notes. 
while in a hot tub. How baller is that? <laughs> like if you're like, yeah. just give me, just give me like a, just give me like a pipe. Just give me a pipe right now and play some kind of like, like doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, something like that. I was preparing for this in a hot tub, thinking about a Turkish bath, and I got lost in daydreaming. And this is a beautiful moment of like, wow, if I could time travel back, I was thinking I would love to go on the Titanic. Like even aware it's going to sink, like I would love to go like take a hot tub, a Turkish bath. That's knowing that it's going to sink. And of course, if I time traveled back, would I get on it? Of course not. But what I'm saying is they did a great job selling this. People that got on here didn't know it was, of course, it's not going to sink. It's unsinkable. It was a very appealing, cool experience. There was so much here to do. The lower deck has more stuff. It's the lowest complete deck, G deck. And it had uh, portholes just above the water line. You're almost right at the water line. There's a squash court located here. That's pretty fun. You want to get some exercise. Along with a traveling post office and food was stored here. And finally, the Orlock decks and tank top, they don't even really count. They're on just the lowest level of the ship below the water line. The Orlock decks were used as cargo spaces while the tank top, the inner bottom of the ship's hull, provided the platform which the ship's boilers, engines, turbines, and electro generators were housed. That's pretty good descriptive stuff right there. Betsy Johnson wrote something in the comments, and so I'm just going to ignore it. Never mind. Um, let me see. I couldn't possibly eat without a warm, wet finger towel delivered with ornate tongs from individual silver tray covered to keep warm. Betsy, you're a duchess. You're absolutely duchess. <laughs> um, the Titanic's passengers numbered approximately 1,317 people, 324 in first class. 284, 50 less in second class, and the largest was third, more than both combined, 709. 869 men, two thirds, and a little over one third, 34%, 447 female women, 107 children aboard, the largest of whom were in third class. Let's keep talking about it. I told you, this is every detail i'm telling you you guys are so lucky that you're here we're winning like you're here lucky to hear this i'm lucky to have you here and you know we're just it's an amazing thing all the way around when are you gonna get to who was who survived was it all the women of course I, I'm, I'm i'm talking about everything i'm not kidding you and what um so don't think what we get to that well i mean i kind of already did just like if, no it, it was considered unsinkable because First of all, when the iceberg hits, it's kind of jumping ahead now, but it's supposed to withstand the flooding of four compartments even. And they had like watertight doors. It goes into five and pretty pretty quickly. And you know, God have mercy on them, God help them. How, how horrifying. They knew pretty quickly, the people who of the crew, it's gonna sink. But people just thought it's no, like we're gonna avoid the icebergs. We'll talk about that. Why did they miss the iceberg warnings, whatever, and all that kind of stuff. We're gonna avoid the icebergs. Even if there is this problem, it'll be spotted. Even if we bump into it, it's so well built. That's why the lifeboats were so um, low in number. Yes, a part of it was don't pollute the deck with these ugly boats. We want the rich people, you know, can't eat without a warm, wet finger towel, which is, you know, hilarious. Exactly, perfectly described. These kind of elite upper crust society members to feel like I'm having this palatial experience, but it also was, which is not going to sink. It's the height of engineering. It's, it's absolutely modern ingenuity, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it was just, I, I, when I say hubris, I'm not criticizing these people. I'd probably be double arrogant. I'm just saying it's like you, you kind of assume it's just perfectly built. Yeah. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, there you go. So maybe maybe there's some failure in the quality control of the testing. There's also, I don't want to just jump ahead on the on the conspiracy theories. There's a fire that burns on board for a couple of days. The passengers never learn about. And some people is one of the is one of the conspiracy theories say, well, first of all, where did that fire come from? I was going to go think, think it out to damage the part of the ship that eventually hits the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And it's this perfect storm that that fire had weakened some of those, some of those restraints, made the engineering, um, well, just less resilient to any kind of contact, whether with anything. I, iceberg's the top of the list. But so people are even thinking perhaps, even if you run into some problems with stuff in the water, like icebergs, and what is now known today, where it sank as Iceberg Alley. And the survivors will talk about there's icebergs everywhere. Around it. It's not just this, this one random one. Like in the movie, it makes it seem like just one iceberg and nothing there. They're all around this, you know, place. We're going to talk about everything. Um, okay. The ship, here's more stuff on the ship. Talk about the decks, everything we're talking about for the last time. And again, everything. It was equipped with its own waterworks, capable of heating and pumping water to all parts of the vessel. 
Main water supply was taken uh, aboard while the Titanic was in port, but in an emergency, the ship could also distill fresh water from seawater. That's freaking crazy. Talk about like, that's modern tech right there. Um, although this was not a straightforward process, you think? I mean, this is amazing they even were trying this. It's incredible. I tell all my classes always, whatever class, all of us are children of the 1880s. I used the example last class, the 1904 St. Louis Fair. They're trying to do wireless internet with wireless telegraph. 1912 is last week. This is all modern stuff. They would totally be understand like a network of wireless internet on board. They just didn't have the tech, but they were all in this kind of inventive spirit, Tesla, Edison, all these kind of people, you know, Alexander Graham Bell. Um, so the fact they have this kind of stuff on here, yeah, it, it literally once more adds to the myth of the unsinkable ship. It's been perfectly designed. It is massive, 900 feet long, and it can withstand anything. And also we have this kind of like today, like we have the 5G internet, we have the newest tech. We have stuff built by NASA, that kind of attitude. It has the latest features, so to speak. It's a radio telegraph equipment, which was then known as wireless telegraphy, was leased to the White Star Line by Marconi International Marine Communication Company. The transmitter was one of the first Marconi installations to use a rotary spark gap, which gave Titanic a distinctive musical tone that could be readily distinguished from other signals. The transmitter is one of the most powerful in the world. It could broadcast over a radius of 350 miles. Titanic was laid out in a much lighter style, in a much lighter style, similar to that of contemporary high-class hotels. It was literally built like a hotel, the Ritz Hotel, the Ritz Carlton being the kind of beau ideal. When you board this, even if you're going to third class, that grand staircase, the ballrooms, you want you to think you're at the Ritz, right? You're putting on the Ritz, as that famous song goes. Like, this is the height of luxury. First class cabins finished in the empire style. This kind of architectural design, interior design school, is empire, like Roman emperor. Don't you feel like a Roman emperor here? A variety of other decorative styles, ranging from the Renaissance to Louis the Fourteenth, were used to decorate cabins and public rooms in first and second class areas of the ship. The aim was to, quote, convey an impression that the passengers were in a floating hotel rather than a ship. As one passenger recalled, on entering the ship's interior, one, one would, quote, at once lose the feeling that we are on board a ship and seem instead to be entering the hall of some great house on the shore. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example is like the Breakers Vanderbilt Mansion. It's like I'm floating on the Breakers. That communication system. He said that basically all they had was Morse code. But they used to, they had some kind of a rotating thing that would put out. Again, my, my technological system. ignorance is endless. I have no idea what that means. It's mm -hmm. wireless telegraphy. I, I don't know. I think they use Morse code to send the distress signals. I will tell you soon, we talk about the ships. The Carpathia eventually comes to the Titanic's rescue. There are other ships that pick up the distress signal. Mm -hmm. Other ships say like, we can't be there till the Carpathia arrives at 4 a.m. Um, an hour and a half after the ship has sunk and people are floating in lifeboats, just absolute horror scene. And imagine you not to get too far ahead, but when you're in those lifeboats, you want to avoid going down with the ship and the funnel and the pressure, the sucking motion of, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just absolutely horrifying. But there, there are ships who pick up this distress signal and say, we can't be there till 6 a.m. at the earliest, we're too far away. There's another ship, the Californian, that just doesn't respond. I don't know why. So I, I under my my promise, like I hope to give you like 78, we've already covered like 20 things, 78, nine awesome facts, things you've maybe never heard of. I don't know with that, so I can't comment further. I have no idea what that means in terms of like the actual tele, I'll read you what the technology is, the facts thing. I don't know what that means vis-a-vis -vis Morse code versus a more kind of sophisticated thing. I don't think communication was the problem. From what I've seen is when the ship is going down, they're able to tell people we're going down. There's no one in the area to help them. Yeah. It, a ship gets it right away. So communication, 100%, you know, A+. plus. Brad King is telegraphing or Morse code, you know, typing out SOS to us. I got your message. We're 10 hours away. Like the message isn't the problem. So we can't get to you. That's what I've always, you know, heard was the, was the main problem. Among the more novel features available to first-class passengers was a seven-foot deep, deep saltwater swimming pool. Not just a squash court and uh, Turkish bath, but a gymnasium as well. The Turkish bath comprised an electric bath, steam room, cool room, massage room, hot room. First class common rooms were impressive in scope and lavishly decorated. One included a lounge in the style of the Palace of Versailles. 
There were men's smoking rooms, reading and writing rooms. There is an a la carte restaurant in the style, once more of the Ritz Hotel, which is run as a concession by the famous Italian restaurateur Gaspari Gatti. I already talked about the Cafe Parisian's dedicated in style of French sidewalk cafe. Um, there's also a veranda cafe where tea and light refreshments were served that offered grand views of the ocean. Pretty sweet. I mean, I want to, don't you want to go on this trip? I definitely want It's unsinkable. Let's go on it, right? I mean, you, it probably would not take a lot of convincing to get people to want to go on this trip. I'll buy you a ticket, Marie. You want to come? Of course, right? Who's going to say no? Unless you really have a reason that I just know I don't want to go to America or whatever. Like, and if you're a rich person, like some of these guys, I'm going to read you some of these names. And that also factors into the conspiracy. Um, if you're a rich person, just takes trips to Europe willy nilly whenever you want back and forth. I mean, this is, this is the thing this is the kind of, this is like trying to sign up for Elon Musk's, you know, SpaceX trip to outer space. Like the rich guys, Bezos and those guys did that. That's literally the Titanic from the first class doesn't, or the, the God rest their souls, the recent Titanic submersible thing. They paid what? $250,000 a seat. Of course you do. If you have billions of dollars, right? Why not? So it probably doesn't take a lot of convincing people on board, especially if third class tickets are more affordable. Um, now listen to this, this is a huge point. And my last point about D-Deck, uh, on D-Deck, there's a dining saloon that could seat 600 passengers at a time. It's 114 long feet long by 92 feet wide. It's like a basketball court. It's amazing. It's unbelievable how huge it is. It's longer than, and bigger than a basketball court. It's huge. Third class, commonly referred to as Steerage, the working class, working class is in steerage, steerage, yeah, exactly. You're both right, you both get full credit. Third class accommodations aboard Titanic, duh, were not as luxurious as first or second, fine. Everyone knows that, but they were way better than ships on ships at the time. It's very important to realize when you get that our, our leftist friends, our most communist minded, oh, the rich people were just, no, like it, the best place to be a poor person on transatlantic travel was on the Titanic. Obviously not with what happened, but, you know, as, assuming what everyone thought was going to happen, a safe passage. It was awesome. Most transatlantic ships just had dormitories and a couple of toilets. And that was it. If you're third class, sorry, you're an Irish peasant. Yep. I mean, just sorry, man. You're escaping the potato famine. Truly, may God bless you. I mean that sincerely. And I wish you all the success finding the American dream. This passage across the Atlantic is not going to be pleasant for you. It, but, but how bad do you want this dream? It's only going to take a week or something. You'll be in America. You just have a dorm and a toilet, right? That's not what's going on in Titanic. Third class accommodations had their own dining rooms, own public gathering areas, open deck space, even, which is that, that that was not an often thing. You're almost how sad. Talk about, yeah, a true human rights abuse on a lot of these ships where people were like packed in like cattle. No, you have open deck space, a smoking and reading room. Um, although they were not as glamorous in design as the spaces above, because you're comparing them like Versailles, they still were way above. A lot of the third class reading room is better than the first class reading room on other ships. Incredible. And leisure facilities were available to all these people. Remember, the Turkish bath is on, on one of the lower decks. You can go there, you can go use the squash court, the gym, right? Whatever, sign up, you know, however that worked. Mm -hmm. Indoor amenities like the library, smoking rooms, gymnasium, all this was um, available. And here's a funny thing it was not uncommon for ambitious mothers to use the list of rich bachelors hosted in in class A to try to sell, try to marry up their daughters. Hey, my, my daughter is this beautiful Irish girl. Um, you're a rich wasp from Philadelphia. It's a match made in heaven, <laughs> right? You're, a, you're, you're an English Lord and you like beautiful women, right? So you have money, she's beautiful. Why don't you guys get married? It's what was, not- What was the sleeping? In their class. No, uh, still dormitory? yeah, still kind of dormitory, kind of garbage, gar garbage compared to Versailles. But I'm just, I'm trying to make the point that, you know, honestly, I think it's been made. Third class is way, way better than third class anywhere else. You know, imagine like, you know, God bless all homeless people. I mean, all homeless people, indeed, that's Christ in disguise, right? I mean, they, they find shelter and all that. There's probably better and worse places to be homeless. It's always bad to be homeless. It's always, but there's probably some places where it's much more manageable and places where it's really difficult. Being in third class on a ship is not ideal. You'd much rather be in second or first. If you had to be in the worst class on a ship, the Titanic was the best of that situation okay. by far. Do you think like dorms like you're in college? Often like cots. Like no, 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 no. Third, for third class, they're like cots, beds, like just it's laid like, out. Kind of. like in the, movie. the, the movie's fairly accurate, yeah, okay. sure. But what, what I'm saying is the other third class accommodations had the cots 
like in the movie and nothing else, no open deck space, no gym, no bath, just, and like no toilets, basically. It just like, was uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty rough, pretty rough go. So it wasn't actually It was like that, but more amenities than they show in the movie. Oh, okay. So like, it, what they don't show in the movie is just make it seem like, you know, Rose is just so out of, no, Rose is from first class. Jack is so, you know, he's not able to do anything, go up anywhere. Like from what I understand, travel was pretty free between levels. Everyone could go use some of these amenities, go on the deck, fine. There are some places at where there are like rich snob first class people get these poor people out of my face. Of course, I'm sure there were. You know, I don't want to even see these immigrants. Uh, there's probably that, definitely. But what I'm saying is it wasn't only that. And, and the, the, the third class people could, could expect a more luxurious trip than any of them could ever imagine compared to any other accommodations at the time. One of the most distinctive features is, uh, is the first class staircase, also known as the Grand staircase right built of solid solid english oak with a sweeping curve it descended through seven decks of the ship between the boat deck to e deck terminating in a single flight on f deck very so very beautiful this is this is when everyone knows the movie right it's when like rose comes down the deck the thing and jack sees her and he's like wow she's unbelievably beautiful and she's like this guy's so handsome and like we're in love now right that's the plot of the story i guess now we're in love uh, <laughs> That's like the grand staircase of the movie. Okay, Titanic does some dry runs. Titanic's sea trials begin 10 days before the maiden voyage, April 2nd, 1912. Um, the sea trials consisted of a number of tests, how the Titanic could handle her handling characteristics. Over the course of about 12 hours, she's driven at different speeds, turning ability is tested, crash stop is per performed, which they try to do in face of this uh, Iceberg, right? Crash stop when the engines are reversed, full ahead to full astern, bringing her to a stop in a, an 850 yard uh, area, about a little over three minutes. Can Titanic do this? Can, can she maneuver in this way? The ship covers a distance of about 80 nautical miles. Nautical miles are larger than normal miles. And 80 nautical miles is 92 real miles, earth miles, whatever. So almost at 92, I'm going to add an extra eight. So let's call it 100 miles you know, of kind of like, you know, going around and she reaches a maximum speed of just under 21 knots. All good in testing. So now finally, you've heard about the ship, the captain, more details than probably you knew or you could have even wanted to know. Let's talk about the maiden voyage itself. The maiden voyage begins on Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. Titanic um, disembarks the Southampton pilot out of the English Channel and travels 77 nautical miles to the French port of Cherbourg. C-H-E-R-B-O-U-R-G. 89 real miles. I'm just, now I'm just remember the real miles, are, I'm going to do the nautical miles because it's, it's cooler. And it's, we're talking about maritime stuff. Just remember, 77 nautical miles is 89 miles on land. She travels, it's, the number's always larger in real earth miles, so to speak. Wait, where did she move from? From England. From, from, from uh, no, from Ireland? Did, oh, I thought like me stuff. I thought... I thought it goes from, from England to France, and it goes France to Ireland, then Ireland across the sea. I think that's correct. I, I, I think that's correct. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Because, no, no, you're, and first of all, not that these details aren't important. They all matter. But no, yes, she, she leaves, the, she leaves uh, England. She's built in Belfast. She's constructed in Belfast, going back to as far as 1908 and 1909. But when she's finally, you know, import ready to disembark from England, goes number first stop, two stops before the, the, the big journey across the ocean. First stop is in the French port of Cherbourg. And then on April 11th, the next day, Titanic arrives at Cork Harbor on the south coast of Ireland. Um, the original plan, remember, UK, France, Ireland. She's in Ireland April 11th. The original plan is to arrive at New York, Pier 59, in the morning of April 17, 1912. That was the scheduled flight plan, so to speak. Leave Ireland on April 11th, less than a week, not bad, you know, six days to cross the Atlantic Ocean, arrive in New York on April 17th. Titanic follows the Irish coast as far as Fastnet Rock, distance of some 55 nautical miles. From there, she'll travel um, 1,620 nautical miles along a great circle route to cross the North Atlantic to reach a spot in the ocean known as, quote, the corner southeast of Newfoundland, talking about North America at this point, Canada, of course, where westbound steamers would at that point, like a railroad, 
switch a line, change course. Um, from that point, she would have gone to Ambrose Light and finally onto New York Harbor. However, Titanic only sails a few hours past the corner when she makes fatal contact with this iceberg. So if you look at a map, it's pretty far into the journey. And of course, right? Remember, the contact with the iceberg is the night of April 14th. That's already in, that she sinks on the morning of the 15th. It's only, it's only two days from reaching her destination. So she's already been across the North Atlantic for four days at that point. It's four days in the Titanic goes, the movie's very accurate too, with like Rose and Jack doing the boat thing when she's on whatever, right? And they're dancing and all the kind of parties and the sunsets and rise in a couple days. Like it doesn't happen immediately. It's, it's on the back end of the journey. Okay. Um, so from April 11th, departing Ireland, Titanic covers 484 nautical miles, the following day, 519. And by noon on the final day of her voyage, 546 nautical miles. So she's doing um, around 500 nautical miles a day, which is very, very good progress. Once more, like 484 nautical miles in the first day journey is 557 miles. From here to Boise is like 300 miles. So I'm going to say Boise to uh, almost the Canadian border is about 500 miles. That's pretty good on water for a boat to be real space to be covering every day, right? Averaging about 24 miles an hour, but 21 knots at cruising speed. Um, okay, so on April 13th, Titanic crosses a cold weather front with strong winds and waves up to eight feet. At this point, waves are kind of battering inside the ship. Imagine when the lower decks are already like the real lower decks with squash cord is like into like where you can see what well, what is what are the windows called on a boat? They have a special name, like portholes. Portholes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so looking out to the portholes, I mean, this is just like all the seawater fierce. They die down on the evening of April 14th. And this is, yeah, I'm getting like chills already talking about this. This is the day. This is the day, later this day. But it gets very cold. It's getting very cold outside. So people go to bed on April 14th, say 8, 9, 10 o'clock. Or some people are staying up. If you're a first class gentleman, you're probably smoking a cigar in some lounge with whiskey or something, right? You know, in your kind of like English livery, right? Mm. Anyone watch uh, Downton Abbey? The first episode of Downton Abbey is actually that one of the heirs has been killed on the Titanic. Like Lord Grantham and those guys at dinner, right? They always have their perfect suits. I want one so bad. Um, I was told I'm not allowed to have one. Hey, uh, they told me, by the way, I can call them Will and Kate. This isn't me being disrespectful. Will and Kate, can you guys hook me up with Buckingham Palace livery? <laughs> I want that. I want to wear that to like a hippo lecture one day. And be like, my livery is worth more than everyone's combined income in this room. <laughs> And just say how how I have two questions for you about that. When everyone's like looking like a gate, I'm like number one, how dare you? Number two, how could you? And then you start my thoughts. Just show up in white tie for one of them. Can I please? I would like to. Do I? Are you cool with that? I know. That might be good. All right, <laughs> guys. You know, I don't know. Whatever. Why? Why not? Why Wait, not? Do they wear white tie and don't see it? Or black tie? I'm going to go white and white tie. I'm going to call it, um, uh, I'm going to call it cookies and cream tie. I'm like, I'm like, I'm an American. I'm an American. I can wear a cookies and cream style. I'm doing black, white. I'm doing Dalmatian tie. And uh, the queen said I could do it. That would be my excuse. Heavy side. Heavy side. <laughs> Heavy side because you realize like, oh, he can pull it off. Not everyone can. <laughs> I, 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 I have a weary side for lesser men who can't put off that look. I get it. I understand. Um, anyways, okay. So people right now are kind of winding down for the evening. Um, Betsy, I promise I'll come to your comment in a second. Betsy, I love when you make comments in the chat. It, seriously, it makes the class amazing. Thank you. I promise I'll, I'll read every every last word you wrote in one second. Mm -hmm. um, so, so remember, people are winding down April 14th at 11.40 p.m., a lookout by the name of Frederick Fleet spots an iceberg immediately ahead of the Titanic and alerts the bridge. First officer, William Murdoch, orders the ship to be steered around the iceberg and the engines to be reversed. First officer, William Murdoch, orders the ship to be steered around the iceberg and the engines to be reversed. This kind of full stop procedure they practiced in the dry room 10 days earlier, but it's too late. The starboard, thank you, the right side, as Brad and Barb explained to me, I'm not even kidding. Like, I would not. Starboard is right, port is left, right? Right. Uh, and I'm not sure how long you can remember that now. That's a really cool etymology of that word. Like you go into port on port side, you know, that's perfect. 
The right side, starboard side Titanic strikes the iceberg, creating a series of holes below the waterline. The hole was not punctured, but was dented such that it seems buckled and separating, allowing the water to rush in. And here's the tr truly tragic sad part. Five of the watertight compartments are breached. It's unsinkable because you have watertight compartments. It can't sink. And if it does, if one of these flood well, we can remain afloat with four compartments flooded. Five are breached. They know immediately. Once they realize that they know immediately what's going to happen, they start typing out this distress signal right away, right? She began sinking bow first, the front of the ship, down in the water, right? With water spilling from compartment to compartment. Those aboard the Titanic were ill-prepared for such an emergency, obviously. In accordance with accepted practice at the time, ships were all ships were largely seen as unsinkable. And like I said earlier, that the lifeboats would only be there pro forma. It's not going to sink. It's going to be terrifying. But tell everyone to calm down and just wait for rescue, right? People don't under, this is a, this is like a, a bomb going off on the ship. Um, Titanic only has about half of the lifeboats to carry those on board. If the ship had been at full carrying capacity of 3.3 thousand people, it would have been a third. Remember, there's only lifeboats for about a thousand people. There's two and a half thousand on board. There's supposed to be three and a half thousand. And the crew had not been trained adequately in carrying out an evacuation. Today, if you go on an airline, obviously the stewardess always does the kind of demonstration, right? In the case of a unscheduled drop in cabin pressure, pull your mask on, blah, blah, blah. These guys are just, yeah. No. At least from the movie, that the when they spun the iceberg, didn't they get to the captain? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all going to keep going or something. No, so yeah. I think the movie's actually pretty faithful. No, the guy like rings down the bell and they tell the captain, they tell everyone in the control room, hey, and they, they, they act right away. It's just like, hey, we're driving a train at blank. There's a deer on the track, dead. You can't stop the train. The train needs X amount of time to stop. They just couldn't turn it fast enough. I think they tried. Could they have done that before they hit the iceberg? No, see, th that would take an, an amazing amount of foresight of which they were not prepared for. They weren't planning on hitting an iceberg. And I, I know you're saying, like, I, I think once they spot it, they hit it within, hit it fast enough within like 10 minutes or whatever it is. They don't have time to do that at that point. Yeah, it's, it's, not, like, it's not like today with technology, you press a button, it like locks automatically. I think it would have been, a, there was not enough time. And, yeah, right. And the thing with icebergs also is there's a huge amount under the water that you don't see. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they can, you know, the, the lookout can see it and think, okay, we have time, but in reality, literally, like right there. that's the best comment of the day. Here's the boat, here's the, the top, the iceberg is here. It's kind of exactly right, exactly. Yeah, Indeed. Yeah, these colloquial phrase colloquial phraseology comes from these realities. You see the tip of the iceberg. Could they have run around and I'm not kidding. That also sounds like you know, I think you know, I think it was a sheer enough cliff. No, that was not an option. I honestly think they did what they, they did. did everything they possibly could. I really think like they did everything they possibly could. I, I, I don't think they were all very experienced, um, you know, naval officers and all that. And at this point, like these airline pilots who are former Air Force guys, they were, it was the best of the best. The White Star Line was incredibly wealthy and wanted to be, and wanted to establish itself as the premier kind of transatlantic travel service before airplanes, mm -hmm. um, before that's even an option. They hired the best. They did everything they could. This was not one of those things, oh, these people were kind of clowning around. The captain was drunk. No, these people were like, they did everything they could. Perhaps the, the one mistake was the hubris that we could just kind of go through this ice field. Maybe, you know, maybe there's less discretion. We'll talk about that in a second. I think they did everything they could. Well, the other, not only tip of the iceberg saying, but the other saying that this is a good example of the one that says assumption is the mother of all true Exactly. If you assume, right, exactly. you assume, yeah, and you divide it up, right? Exactly. No, you're right. Yeah, don't, don't assume. Okay. Uh, Sadly, okay, third-class passengers were largely left to fend for themselves. It's pretty accurate in the movie. Causing many of them to become trapped below the decks, the ship filled with water. The quote, women and children first protocol was generally followed when loading the lifeboats. And most of the male passengers, you know, God bless them, you know, heroes, right? No man has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his neighbor. Most of these men are like, no, I'm a man. I'm going to be, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be like true manly here. Virtue, beer, that Italian root, like, you know, energetic manliness. I will save the women and children. So women and children survive at rates of 75 and 50%. Women, 75, children, 50, men, 20%. Well, you know, four out of every five guys dies on the Titanic. 
Between 2.10 and 2.15 a.m., a little over two and a half hours after Titanic has struck the iceberg, her rate of sinking increases. As the boat deck dips underwater and the sea pours in through open hatches and gates, grates. As her unsupported stern rose out of the water, remember she's going bow down, right? Exposing the propellers, the ship broke in two main pieces between the second and third funnels due to the immense forces on the keel. With the bow underwater and air trapped in the stern, the stern remained afloat and buoyant for a few minutes longer, rising to a nearly vertical angle with hundreds of people still clinging to it before foundering at 2.20 a.m. It was believed originally in the confusion the Titanic sank in one piece, but discovery of the wreck many years later confirmed, in fact, that she had broken in two. Mm -hmm. All remaining passengers and crew were immersed in water temperature of 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. This is insane. People died within minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I was taking a hot tub today, preparing for this lecture. I'm totally serious. You know, and haha, it's funny. And like, I love hot tubs. I love whatever. I, I really do. I love uh, hot spring culture. A hot tub, a hot spring is about 103, 104 degrees. It's very warm. 107, that's warm. If you get in a hot tub at 90 degrees, it's cold. If you get in at 70, you're freezing. 70 degree water temperature getting into is not comfortable. Like, like, like a yes. pool, a pool in the summer, you get in like a rainy park, Moscow pool, and you get, ooh, brisk, it's like 75 degrees. Yes. 28 degrees. And I don't know, the 32 degrees it should be technically frozen. It's only not frozen because of the salt and the churning waves. So, so people who are, you know, getting this water die within minutes, just, just die within minutes, just die, just shut down, yeah. right? Um, typical water temperatures, this is so sad too, we're normally around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, still awful, but they're 17 degrees colder, just because it was an unseasonably cold yeah. April in the North Atlantic. Brad, earlier to your point, okay, so everyone's in the water at this point, distress signals were sent by wireless rockets and lamps, everything, and immediately. But none of the ships that responded were near enough to reach the Titanic before she sank. A radio operator on board the SS Burma estimated it would have been 6 a.m. before the liner could arrive. The SS Californian, which was the last to have been in contact before the cl collision, saw the flares but failed to assist. I don't know why. I don't know. I, I, I should. I, we're going to be here already full time to 1.30, definitely. Probably a little bit longer. Anyone needs to leave, please leave. I'm going to do this. This is going to be my longest lecture of the semester, probably. Once more, I should have broken stuff over two classes. Just so much good stuff to get through here. Sad, tragic stuff, but so much info. We can't interview for nine hours. I don't know why the California didn't, do, but she did not assist. Around 4 a.m., the famous Carpathia, the RMS Carpathia, arrives in the scene. This is already an hour and a half after the Titanic had sank. Remember, people die in 28 degree water in three minutes. Do you think, what is 90 minutes? Right? Yeah. So, so if you're not in a lifeboat, you're dead at this point. You've been long dead. When the ship sank, the lifeboats that had been covered were only filled up to an average of 60%. 706 people survived the disaster and were conveyed by Carpathia to New York, which was, of course, the original destination. And once more, like I said, 1,517 people died. Carpathia's captain described the place as an ice field that included 20 large icebergs measuring up to 200 feet high. That's insane. That is freaking insane. 20 icebergs, 200 feet high, all of them. Just it's complete. That's why to this day, it is known as Iceberg Alley. These passengers who were in the boats described being, quote, in the middle of a vast white plain of ice studded with icebergs. So there's icebergs everywhere here. It's not like a, the movie, that's one of the things in the movie that I thought was like, the movie did a great job. Oh, it's this, you know, sappy love story, Kate and Jack and fine. Which is, I, I, I think it's cool. I, I like their love story anyways. I think that's, I also like that. But but you can criticize the kind of rom, you know, it's not, there's no calm, rom tragedy, I guess. Uh, the kind of romantic, you know, Kate and Jack story is kind of superfluous, but the Titanic movie does a good job overall being pretty faithful. Here, I think was the one point where it seems like it's a black ocean where the water looks like it's 60 degrees normal and this huge iceberg. There's icebergs everywhere in this thing. Um, really quickly, why does the Titanic, uh, why does it hit this iceberg? Because icebergs, although the, the Titanic's number one um, goal was to provide luxury, this kind of floating Ritz, Ritz Hotel, Breakers Mansion, well, they want it to be fast as well. We're not going to, people are not going to enjoy the luxury if the trip that's supposed to take six days is like three weeks. So it is moving fast. And there is perhaps, here's the arrogance or hubris, um, people treated iceberg warnings 
as part of the thing. It's not, you know, no big deal. It's like a tornado warning. I live in Oklahoma. Come on. It's not actually a tornado. I don't have to take mm -hmm. cover. That kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. you, you live in Tornado Alley. You've seen enough tornadoes dissipate. You're not going to take cover when, when the big one hits. You have survived enough hurricanes. They're saying evacuate. No, it's that kind of attitude. So full steam ahead. We know there's icebergs there. We've been warned. There was a lot of advanced warnings about possible iceberg problems. Come on. It's the unsinkable ship. That's the one thing where I'm not criticizing people. Just that, that might be one of the kind of human error factors. I think once this kind of got underway and it was too late, they did everything they could. But it's like maybe in advance, they should have been more cautious. I don't know. Uh, Carpathia takes three days to reach New York. She actually arrives 9.30 p.m. on April 18th. So a day after the original scheduled itinerary. 40,000 people are waiting in heavy rain because by this time it's become worldwide news. In fact, at first, the Carpathia is typing out over the wireless information. The initial reports with the American press says Titanic was being towed to port by the SS Virginian. Later that day, that very day the 15th, there's confirmation everyone has died. The ship is at the bottom of the ocean, you know, horrible. Crowds of people, this is one of the first worldwide disasters. Crowds of people um, go to the White Star Lines offices in London, New York, Montreal, Southampton, Liverpool, Belfast. Southampton perhaps is most affected on a human level um, because four out of every five crew members came from this town. So Southampton, it's like a thing we'll see next week when an entire you know, um, group of soldiers from one small British enclave dies in the Great War. Like all these people die. Yeah, it just, just adds to the kind of, you know. Um, all right, we're almost done with the chronology. That's basically it. We're gonna get to the conspiracies and the Catholic reaction. Last two survivors, Titanic, Two, you know, beautiful women. May they may they rest in peace. May they be in heaven now. Eliza Gladys Dean is the oldest survivor. She died May thirty first, two thousand nine. She died. Um, what is that? Fourteen years ago, at the age of ninety seven. She was born February second, nineteen twelve. She was two months old. When she was on Titanic, the youngest passenger. And then Barbara Joyce Dayton, born uh, May twenty fourth, nineteen eleven, was, you know, eight months, nine months old, whatever. She was the last remaining survivor of, from second class, died October 16th, 2007. So these women died both at age 97 into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Imagine like, you know, my earliest memory as a kid is like, I think I'm six years old. Of course, they have no memories being two months and eight months old. But imagine like that was your like baptism by fire. You survived the Titanic. It's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Conspiracies. What are some conspiracies? Well, kind of the main conspiracy is that uh, J.P. Morgan who ends up being instrumental in founding what? What does J.P. Morgan found? The central bank, the Fed, that he puts his rivals on this thing, these rich guys who oppose it and sinks it on purpose. With all conspiracies, my one response, honestly, is question mark. I think it's awful to accuse people of conspiratorial things because you, you fall into the sin of calumny. Like, I'm going to accuse this guy of basically assassinating people. That's evil if you don't have the evidence. At the same time, to dismiss anything out of hand is not what historians should do. What are the facts? I don't know. Do I think, do I think that, that they did this on purpose? No, I don't. But but I'm gonna read you what some of these theories are. Yeah, go ahead. Wasn't there a guy who was like controlling like the 25% that needed? Like, so there's a lot of that. Well, let me let me let me talk about this. So on some of the wealthiest men in the world are on board the Titanic. John Jacob Astor IV, mm -hmm. Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss. Apparently. Although Astor and Guggenheim never speak on the subject, and Strauss apparently spoke in favor, apparently all of them opposed this thing. All of them died in the sinking. Okay, Astor, Guggenheim, and Israel Strauss, who the conspiracy theory goes, are opponents of J.P. Morgan, and they're rich enough and powerful enough to oppose him, creating the central bank, um, die. J.P. Morgan is a controlling partner in the White Star Line. He's scheduled to be on the maiden voyage. The day of, he cancels and stays at a bathhouse in France. That fuels his conspiracies. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy was supposed to be on it. He knew it wasn't happening. I do not want, I think it is a sin to say, oh yeah, look, he did it. I don't know if he did it or not. I don't think so. How, how would he do it exactly? It's probably hard to engineer a sinking of a ship. Um, unless again, you get, hey, yeah, exactly. He, he paid off iceberg. I mean, it's pretty crazy to kind of, I don't know. But, th but that has, that is one. And then the Fed comes into play actually after Morgan dies next year, 1913. The Fed is signing the law. Woodrow Wilson is the president then. Um, that that you know winter december of 1913 um, 18 months after that's the number one kind of conspiracy 
that uh, J.P. Morgan, who did own the White Star Line, kind of main board of directors, as much as the ultimate principal owner, puts his rivals in this thing, has them die, and there he can, you know, reap the benefits if they're not going to produce them because they're dead. You know, kind of like a mob style hit. I, I don't know. I, I, that to me, likelihood to me, it seems not likely. But you know, but what do I know? What are other uh, conspiratorial stuff? That it was an inside job to collect insurance money. That a German U-boat sank it. That Captain Smith wanted to set a speed record, and he was literally like, you know, damn the torpedoes, let's do this, whatever. The coal fire one, and then the perfect uh, storm theory which is that the coal fire had already, there was a fire on board. That is not a, that is true, but that that had damaged the, you know, the hole in some way and then it hits a thing anyways. Well, all right, those are your, but the creepiest conspiracy is this. This is freaking creepy. You guys ready? Get ready to feel like, ooh, feel creepy. The Wreck of the Titan or Futility is a novella written by Morgan Robertson published in 1898. Morgan Robertson writes a book in 1898 called The Wreck of the Titan. One night, while sailing between America and Ireland, 1898, the Titan crashes into a smaller ship, um, but it carries on. The next night, the ship hits an iceberg and capsizes. 13 people survive. Um, although the novel was written before the RMS Titanic was even conceptualized, there are some many uncanny similarities between the fictional real life versions. This is a, a book, a novel written in 1898. Like the Titanic, the fictional uh, ship sank after wrecking on an iceberg in April in the North Atlantic, and there are not enough lifeboats for all passengers. It's, it's basically the story. And so in the aftermath, um, people credited Robertson with precognition and clairvoyance, which he denies. He's like, no. But yeah, he probably could, he probably could have been a sleazeball scumbag uh, charlatan. Oh, yeah, I did predict it. I can read the future. I kind of see that. But that, that one is very creepy. That's not a conspiracy. It's like, that's talking about a coincidence. A guy writes a book about a ship sinking that's not weird but the fact it's called titan titanic is creepy in the same month same style like everything exactly that's pretty creepy that's a pretty that's a wow kind of you know and it's not like well ships are always hitting icebergs right so that's not ships are often probably most commonly sunk by some building defect or war or whatever it's not always so that's very creepy the fact that it's called the titan is really 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 creepy i think okay what are some let's talk about some beautiful things in um conclusions and catholic reactions I gave you one already, uh, Father Brown's Titanic album. Here's what America Magazine wrote. I'll read these two paragraphs to you verbatim. Father Peter Schilliner, SJ, Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, wrote an article in May 1912. This is one month after the sinking, right? Called One Lesson More. Very beautiful. Listen. In the well-merited tribute, the press has been paying the heroes of the Titanic tragedy who observed so chivalrously the law of the sea. Little is said to explain how women first became the rule of conduct in such disasters. The omission should be supplied. For it is to the Catholic Church, which has taught from the beginning what sacred claims the weak and helpless have upon the strong and powerful, that the world is indebted for such high examples of self-sacrifice as those witnessed on the Titanic. So enduring indeed and so thoroughly mastered has been this lesson that it is still the heritage as we see of those the church no longer numbers among her children. That resp respect and reverence for womanhood, moreover, moreover, which also shone out brightly amid the scenes of the wreck is likewise a precious gift which Catholicism has bestowed even on modern unbelievers. The maiden mother of our divine Lord has given every woman a share of her honor. Those that went down with the Titanic acquitted themselves like men because unconsciously they were imitating the medieval knight who saw in every woman a sister of Our Lady. Quote, God fulfills himself in many ways. Even in this dreadful catastrophe that befell the Titanic, the discerning can find witnesses to the power and beauty of the church. Then there's these stories, these three priests. Father Thomas Biles, age 42 of England, Father Joseph Benedict Parishitz, OSB, Order of St. Benedict of Bavaria, and Father Joas Montvia of Lithuania, age 27. Each of these priests died with the ship and none of their bodies um, were ever recovered. When the crash came, uh, we were thrown down from our berths, slightly dressed. We were prepared to find out what had happened. We saw before us coming down the passageway with his hand uplifted, Father Biles. This is, of course, a survivor talking about this priest, mm -hmm. Father Biles. We knew him because he had visited us several times on board and celebrated mass for us that very morning. Be calm, my good people, he said. And then he went about the steerage giving absolution and blessings. A few around us became very excited, and then it was 
that that priest again raised his hand and instantly they were calm once more. The passengers were immediately impressed by the absolute self-control of the priest. He began the recitation of the rosary. The prayers of all, regardless of creed, were mingled and the responses, Holy Mary, were loud and strong. Here is a testimony from Miss Helen Mary Mockler, a third class Titanic pastor, who of course I assume survived to give this testimony later on. Obviously, right? Uh, if her testimony was anyway like written down on board and she, I mean, it would have perished with the wreckage. Quote, when all the excitement became fearful, all the Catholics on board desired the assistance of priests with the greatest fervor. Both priests aroused those condemned to die to say acts of contrition and prepare themselves to meet the face of God. They led the rosary and others answered. The sound of the recitation irritated a few passengers and some ridiculed those who prayed and started a ring dance around them. There you go, right? When, when our Lord comes in time, people are going to be praying, repenting, some people mocking. This is the story of humanity and fallen humanity, right? Why are you going to the church? Why are you, you know, let's get, this is the story of humanity. The two priests were engaged, continuously giving general absolution to those who are about to die. Those entering the lifeboats were consoled with moving words. Some women refused to be separated from their husbands, preferring to die with them. Finally, when no more women were near, some men were allowed into the boats. Father Perishwitz was offered a place, but declines. What a boss, right? Remember, the boats were only 60% full. He could have gone. No, he's like, no, no. He's like, I'm, I'm going to meet my Lord and God straight to heaven. These three Catholic priests um, are hailed. Pope Pius X hails them, um, including, I think, the, I'm trying to find the specific one. Um, I can't find which one of the three. Father Montevilla, Perchewitz, or Biles, one of them is hailed um, by Pius X as a martyr for the faith. That indeed, like in these last moments, they're helping people prepare to meet God. Um, all three of these priests are said to have declined lifeboats in order to offer spiritual aid to travelers who perished in the shipwreck, which claimed 1,500 lives. Um, the priest led passengers in recitation of the rosary and aroused those condemned to die to see acts of contrition prepare to meet God. And they gave general absolution to those about to die. Now, more about Father Biles. April 14th, it was Sunday, right? Low Sunday, Father Biles celebrates Mass for second class and third class passengers. His sermon was prophetic. For he took as his theme the necessity of, quote, having a lifeboat in the shape of religious consolation at hand in case of spiritual shipwreck. That's That'll give you some, like, goosebumps, right? Hey, Father, can you not reach on that, on a boat about shipwreck, you know? yeah literally too early right i mean like literally right right before him you know what i mean right i mean it's crazy his sermon was prophetic for he took as his theme the necessity of quote a lifeboat in the shape of religious consolation hand in case of spiritual uh shipwreck um so the ship later on of course this happens tragically as we all know well i've covered they don't see him at first until Father Biles was still saying his prayers and seemed not to be paying attention to what was happening, thinking like the rest of the passengers, there was no real danger. So Father Biles out there on the deck is it's going down already. The compartments are filled, five, and just very calm. When he realized this was not the case, he went to assist the women and children on the lifeboats. Absolute hero. Indeed, he has known to have helped steerage passengers to the boat deck, those being trapped on the lower levels, like we see in the movie. Uh, the tablet carried extracts from the New York Evening World in which survivors told about Father Biles had been foremost in, quote, keeping the religious aspect of the terrible occasion to the fore by leading the recitation of the rosary as he guided passengers to lifeboats and refusing to board the lifeboat. Even when crew members are saying, Father, it's okay. You know, lay your head to rest. You've done your job. Praise God. No, no. He's, he goes full Captain Smith style. I'll go down with the boat too. I want my heavenly reward from Christ, right? Um, Jeffrey Marcus, in his account of the disaster, describes how some of the first-class passengers continued to play cards in the midst of the chaos. He wrote, the poor Irish boys and girls from the steerage were most profitably occupied. They were down on their knees and praying. On deck, they found English priest Father Biles moving to and fro among the passengers, hearing confession and giving absolution. Father Perschewitz was with him. Father Biles urged people to meet God and about 100 people of all religions, knelt around him on the aft section of the boat, praying the rosary, even as the waters engulfed them. It's very, very beautiful. Last two points. Um, I'm actually amazed it's 128. I thought we'd go to about 145. We're going to be done. It's the last page I have for you. 
but but indeed as you all know like i love our classes are always about an hour and six minutes long today has been the full hour and a half um and we could have you know given three more hours last two catholic points so we've already talked about the america article father brown's album and these three hero priests here's the last two points so five kind of catholic reaction points to this disaster on that faithful voyage, which never made it to New York City, a passenger was named Major Archibald William Butt. William Butt. His name is spelled B-U-T-T. -T. I don't know when Butt colloquially became, you know, synonym for hindquarters. Why did he not change his name to like Butter? <laughs> you know, like William William Butter. Why really? I mean, maybe Butt was more like the butt of a rifle. You know, I don't know. I, don't, I do not know when Butt was, you know, synonymous with the way we use today with Derriere. You know, like I don't know. But this guy's name, again, yes, you know, is Major Bud. He was tasked with a special mission. He was to carry a letter from Pope Pius X and personally deliver it to U.S. President William Taft. What is in that letter, Barb? No one knows. No one knows. The 45-year-old Major perished, may God rest his soul, and all these people, these 1,500 passengers, and the contents of the letter were never to be known. Born in 1865, the close of the Civil War in the South, Augusta, Georgia, Major Butt began a career in journalism after graduating from the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee. He was later first secretary of the U.S. Uh, Embassy in Mexico during the Spanish-American War. He joined the Army in 1908, uh, was appointed as a military aide by another president, Theodore Roosevelt. But actually, if you go to Hello Lock, I think Theodore Roosevelt spoke on the UBI campus in 1908 or 1911, one of those years, either during his presidency or immediately after, but before Titanic. When President Taft was elected, Major Butt was kept on staff and promoted to the rank of Major in 1911. What is in that letter? What was Pius X going to tell the president? This is amazing. We'll never know. Final point. Could have, but he didn't. When, when, when did the Pope die? 1914. Yeah, not, so he. he so maybe he rewrote it. No, never reached out again. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just like, exactly. Mr. President. The Vatican sends uh, our, our, you know, regards. our regards and praying for your success, whatever. Yeah, Taft was on the way out of office by the time anyways. Woodrow Wilson's coming in you know, pretty soon. Wilson will be our president next class with the First World War. Dominic's shaking his head about Wilson. Not a Wilson fan? Yes, Wilson. not a Wilson fan. Got it. Well, that's very interesting. That, there's that Wilson is, in gender, is very strong historical opinions. We'll talk about why next class. Finally, last point, guys. This is signed by James Cardinal Gibbons. Archbishop of Baltimore, John Cardinal Fairley, Archbishop of New York, William Cardinal O'Connell, the Archbishop of Boston, three Catholic pre uh, prelates to the president of the U.S. in the wake of the Titanic disaster, and I will close my class with their words. The Archbishops of the country, in joint session with the trustees of the Catholic University of America, beg to offer to the president of the United States their expression of their profound grief at the awful loss of human lives attendant upon the sinking of the steamship Titanic, and at the same time to assure the relatives of the victims of this horrible disaster of our deepest sympathy and condolence. They wish also to attest hereby to the hope that the lawmakers of the country will see in this sad accident the obvious necessity of legal provisions for greater security of ocean travel. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your day. Please note tonight, Brad was talking about this before class, Barb, too. Uh, Dr. French is coming to give a talk tonight on Eucharistic miracles. A very, uh, it's not a timely topic. It's always timely. To say it's a timely topic is to imply that there's time when it's not timely. It's just a perennially topic, timely topic. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. French is a very cool guy. Yeah, go ahead, Brad. Did, did the band keep playing? Oh, I think so, yeah. That, that's also the, the, those people, too. Imagine, I can imagine, you know, praise God. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The conductor who calmed people to music as they died, just preventing their last moments from being in terror, maybe calmed them enough to make an act of contrition. And that was his way of like being like these priests. Yeah, there were there was you know, that was in the movie and it was definitely part of the story as well. What extent was it? You know, I, but yeah, that, that was there was lots of heroism and lots of awful behavior. Welcome to humanity, right? God forbid if there's a third world war, some kind of atomic fallout, there'd be amazing stories of heroism. And stuff like, I can't believe how barbaric this person acted or whatever, right? It's just kind of humanity. So anyways, God bless you guys. Thank you for being here always. See you next week for the next class is World War One and Spanish uh, flu. And I'll, I'll come to you, last comment, just next class, I'm going to have a 230 slide slideshow.
about the First World War because some things are best kind of seen. And shouldn't the Eucharist miracles go the same friends as when he was on crusade? One of the Eucharistic miracles was him being as far from where he was. And his aide of him said, Let's go. And he said, I think God will see me much more favorably if my faith continues. Sure, to sure. Totally, totally. No, I, 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 I love, I love Eucharistic miracles. I love the confirmation of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, those helps that heaven offers. But blessed are those who have not seen and believed. Yeah. The Saint Thomas. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. See you all. Thanks again for joining us, Betsy. Oh, Betsy, I probably wait, guys, 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 guys. I promised the amazing, incomparable Duchess Betsy Johnson. I would read her comments, and I will. I will. So Betsy wrote, is in, the, the last thing was, remember the, the funny thing Betsy wrote, it was hilarious. Like, well, well uh, done, Betsy, about the warm, wet finger towel. She also had four more, three more comments. Quote, it is interesting the Titanic was just a bit shorter than the average monstrosity of a cruise ship today, indeed. I watched Downton Abbey for the women's dresses. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Me too, like guy version. I love watching like these sick suits these guys wore. <laughs> not even the livery, but this guy is the, you know, Matthew Crawley. His suit is sick. I'm going to, yeah, I agree. The fashion is awesome. Black tie only proper in the evening, okay? Um, I have no idea about dinner tie etiquette. If you told me like a tank top is appropriate, okay. Uh, many container ships weren't all that much longer than the Titanic. Um, Betsy, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us again. Yeah, a hundredth time, but forever. God bless you. Thanks for being here. See ya.